Okay, everyone, let's start today's webinar. Thank you again for joining me. My name is uh, David Baird. Um, I've shared the results of the quick questionnaire we started with today. Um, but if it's on your screen, feel free to obviously close that. And what you should see is the first slide of my presentation. And um, those that have maybe joined me throughout lockdown, it's a little bit less interactive to, today. Um, not, not so much open discussion and Q&A. Essentially, I don't want to take up too much of your time. It's a very quick presentation um, that I'm just going to... Um, that I'm just going to kind of fly through. And really the key outcome for me today is hopefully you can take one or two things uh, and it will get you thinking. Uh, and if that's the case, then for me, I'll, I'll be happy with the, the presentation today. It's really just to get, uh, get people thinking. There'll be some things that are maybe more relevant to coaches, but I think it's really good for parents to hear it because they might not have a, an appreciation of, of some of the things I'm going to discuss. And what I've found a lot is there's parents that have been listening thinking, do you know, I actually know a coach who would benefit from hearing some of these key messages and then they can pass the messages on or get coaches to attend future uh, webinars. Or maybe I'll spark an interest in some parents to actually become a coach. Um, that's the same I found with uh, the messages that I'm giving to parents. I've had coaches that have reached out to me and said, um, I actually know parents that, that would really benefit from some of these key messages because that's what the presentation is essentially, just me sharing some messages from my experience I hope you can apply in your own line of coaching um, or, or being a parent or guardian. Because what I find very often doing these webinars, you're always preaching to the, the converted a little bit. You know, it's people that are keen to learn, people that are keen to invest in and keeping themselves up to date with the most modern um, ideas and, and, and learning off of other people and mixing all these ideas and applying it. Whereas the people that these messages maybe need to reach are maybe not the ones that, 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 um, that applies to. So what I found so far delivering this presentation a lot of people have reached out to me and said, um, would I do a, a kind of behind closed doors webinar specifically with their coaches or their parents at their club? And the answer is always absolutely yes, because these are messages that I want to get, um, that I'm quite passionate about and I want to get out. So you can have a wee think about that today as well. You know, is there a, a, an opportunity for us to network after this presentation and I can come and speak specifically, may, maybe addressing some of the specific issues um, or challenges that your parents, guardians, or coaches need to hear. So if we just uh, crack on with what today is all about. Essentially, um, for signing up for this webinar, you're going to be sent a resource that I'm working on called Practice Through Play, just to give you loads of ideas for when uh, football kind of makes a return uh, onto the pitch. And I just want to maybe justify some of the stuff that's in that resource or, or dive a little bit deeper of how you can, in my opinion, run with it a little bit more. And of course, put your own spin and your own ideas on it. So here we are with the first slide uh, of what today is all about. It's all about presenting children with the opportunity to play in challenging and fun situations. And this will allow them to test their understanding and capabilities and constantly push those boundaries, you know, practice through play as the name of the resource and the name of today's webinar. So today is all about how do we create challenging and fun environments depending on the kids, you know, age and stage of their journey, which I'll, I'll touch on very, very soon. Showing patience and support during this process is a line of messy of, of coaching too. So that's where it comes into speaking to coaches, parents and guardians. You know, how do we actually um, be patient? I, I find that a lot of people off the pitch when I'm asking them, you know, do you think patience is an important um a, an important tool to have when you're working with young players and they say absolutely does it translate often um onto the pitch maybe not in my experience and as it says there in my opinion it's the Lionel Messi of coaching tools it's not it's not the David Baird of coaching tools it's a very very good coaching tool you know and Lionel Messi for me is at the top of his trade so it's not actually easy to perform at the level he performs in so yes patience is important but is it actually quite difficult to apply um, in regards to what we do. So today is just all about how do we create those, um, what I like to call positive learning environments uh, for children. And the first thing I think we can do, um, in my opinion, from, from my experience of working in Scotland, where I work at the moment, uh, and various countries and cultures, academies and teams, I think the first thing we need to do as parents, guardians and coaches, and you'd have heard me speak about this before, but um, I, I dig a little deeper than, than previous uh, webinars, is we need to bring our instruction down. Now, as I say, today's all about just getting you thinking about different things. So if you're the type of person that has a pen and paper in front of you, maybe jot down some ideas. But I would say at the very least, try and have an internal thought um, to yourself. 
Uh, what are the potential dangers of using a lot of instruction when you're either a coach or you're a parent slash guardian on the sideline? What, what are the potential dangers? Now, some of you, if you're comfortable, use the chat function as well, because some of you, I'll be able to learn from a lot of you today as well. So if you want to share your ideas in there and let everyone else on the webinar know, what do you think are the dangers of using instruction when you're coaching young players who are trying to learn, their, uh, learn how to play the game? I'll share a couple of my ideas. The, the great thing I love about the chat um, function here, I may not have time to always look at it, but at the end of the webinar, I can save it and read it through. And I've picked up a lot of great conversations with coaches who have said something and I've wanted to learn from them. So if you do, obviously there's no pressure, you can use the chat function today. So here's my um, ideas on why we, the first thing we can do to create positive learning environments is bring our instruction down. It might stifle creativity. So we may actually instruct a young player to do something, but maybe they actually had a better solution or a more creative solution. I read that recently, which was a fantastic quote from, from Johan Cruyff, when someone asked him how, how often he worked on that uh, Cruyff turn technique before doing it in a game. And he said it wasn't a technique, it was a solution. You know, there was a player there trying to steal the ball and the solution I had was that turn, which we, we then came on to create the Cruyff turn. So we potentially aren't going to get more Cruyff turns or Maradona turns or the Zidane uh, passes, et cetera, et cetera. If we stifle the creativity and through our instruction, we always give preconceived ideas of the way the game should be played. Let's start to look out for how the game could be played. Um, the coach's ego is a massive one for me. You may be guilty of this yourself. I, I know I used to be and I'm trying to get better. You may know a coach like this. If I see a coach who's given instruction, 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 sometimes I'm wondering what the motivation behind it is. And is it about them being seen to be the coach, you know, and, and have this Coaching so trendy at the moment with Pep Guardiola and all the interviews they do on, on Sky Sports and Monday Night Football um, and all these documentaries on Amazon Prime. Um, you know, our coaches seen that and then maybe trying to replicate that and the sessions are actually more about the coach these days than some of the players. That's a question I have when I see a lot of instruction-based coaches. It can be very distracting. So I've, I've seen, um, particularly in the consultation phase of pulling this resource together when we, we watched a lot of coaches' sideline behaviour, they give instruction by the time the kid has listened, the, the young player has listened, you know, had a scan, look for what you're asking them to do. The picture on the pitch has changed and now they actually perform what you asked them to do, but it was now the, maybe the wrong decision or they've given the ball away, for example. Very hard for a, a young child to focus on what they're trying to do and listen to, to a lot of instruction. Um, and on that point, it may not be heard. They may not be listening to you. Whether that's intentional or unintentional, or just a young player's concentration span, there's a danger that your instruction may not be heard. And then the, the other thing about instruction is it is human nature to be defensive. And the parents and guardians listening uh, will maybe know this if they have children. Um, if a, a young footballer or a young person or any person does something and we then instruct them differently, they probably had a justification for why they did it in the first place. And that might be you know, why, what, what, they, um, what they come back with. I always use the example of telling a young player, you know, strike the ball with your laces, and they say, I've scored five goals with my big toe, you know, and they might be absolutely correct, and that's just their justification. They're not thinking about the longer-term uh, development, uh, potentially. A couple of other reasons, but this list could be quite exhausted, exhaustive, and I hope you've, you've wrote some ideas down yourself. The terminology we use might be dated. Um, let's make sure if we are given instruction um, that the players understand it. And that's not treating every player the same because some may use different terminology to others. And that's why it's almost important to um, get instruction from players as opposed to coach the player. You know, what would they call this moment or what would they call this technique? Uh, so, for example, I think we should be avoiding, you know, put it in the box, put it in the mixer, switch a play, hit the line, cut back you know, let's try and talk in their language. And the best way to do that is probably for them to be talking uh, more than us. It may be boring. I'm sure we all like to think that we're really hip and trendy, but the, at the end of the day, we're adults and, and um, positions of authority. So us giving information to young kids might not be that fun. It may be misunderstood, uh, as I've touched on. I always tell the story about seeing a young player in a training game when the coach says, pick it up and run with it. And they picked it up in their hands and started running. Um, so there's, there's these dangers as well. It may be confusing. I feel like I've already uh, touched on that. Referencing the game of 1990 or early 2000s to kids who are essentially going to play the game of 2030. Um, 
and we might restrict problem solving. So that's the that's the biggest one uh, for me. Um, if we're in the business of helping kids learn, then um, giving them the answers isn't going to, they're not learning. And it's a real strange one because we seem to appreciate that in loads of, and again, I'm talking from my experience and some of you may not be guilty of this at all, but we seem to appreciate this in other walks of life. We seem to appreciate that they need to problem solve to learn math, you know, so the teacher has to say, okay, if you have 70p and you spend 10p in a chocolate bar, how much have you got left? And they have all the coins and everything's fun and everything's a game. They may get the answer wrong a couple of times, but once they put their hand up and say 60p and they get a well done and they have an understanding that they did something right, they now have ownership for that learning and they won't forget it because they've problem solved. They've had to be thinking. It's had to go in their brain. And if we can do that in a fun way, I think it's a much deeper um, deeper way to learn. We appreciate it for riding a bike. We appreciate it for driving a car. Um, you know, put the problem in, fall in front of them. Once they work it out, then they'll have ownership of that learning um, and it'll be a stronger way to learn as opposed to us giving them um, giving them instruction. So what practice through play is all about, it's about bringing that instruction down and kind of putting that environment up. So all the things that I want them, um, that, that we perhaps want them to learn, it's kind of hidden within the environment. A lot of people call it guided learning or guided discovery or environment-based learning. Um, so yes, we have things we want them to take away, but it's hidden within the environment. Um, and a couple of examples I always use for environment over instruction. Uh, if you want to learn a language, always use this one. You, you may try the instruction approach where it's webinars and it's one-to-one -one tuition and it's classroom-based stuff. I'm a much funner and a stronger way to learn would be the environment. You go and live in the country. If you want to learn Spanish, you, you go and live in Spain. And it's just a stronger way for them to learn. And that's what practice through play is all about. So if I give you an example, just a little look at some of the things that you receive within the resource. And I'm just going to pause the video just so it loads. And, and I apologize if it's slow, um, may, maybe on your, your Wi-Fi or your computer. But throughout this resource, there's only two different uh, types of content. And I hope that the parents have been patient with me because we really zoom in on parent and guardian behavior a little bit later on. But in regards to coaching, I believe that when players come to football practice, they should either be practicing football or playing football and not really anything without that, out with that. No running around the pitch or standing behind cones or um, standing in shape while I move them around trying to um, second guess what might happen in our game at the weekend. Um, they should be practicing or they should be playing football. So loads of practices that give them the opportunity to learn through trial and error and loads of games that let them practice playing the game of football. So as the, the video starts to move on, here's an example of a practice. It, will be, it won't be new to many of you. The blue players here are trying to keep as many of these footballs alive as they can. The red players are trying to work together to get them all out the square, maybe within a time-limited kind of exercise. Now, by constantly throwing them in these environments, what we're looking for is the red team to maybe press together, the blue team to maybe spread out. But this is giving them the opportunity to practice this. And the next thing I would want you to be thinking about is how difficult, boring, misunderstood, coach's ego, etc., etc., would this kind of practice be through an instruction-based approach? Because you would start to talk about the reds trying to press together, showing one way, pressure cover balance, deny time and space, high intensity, you would start to talk about the blues spreading out, scanning, pass and move, make the pitch big, one or two touch, et cetera, et cetera. Through an instruction-based approach, I think we can fall into all those traps from my first slide. Through an environment-based approach, we can plan and we can let them go. And this is why it's so crucial to get the parents and guardians on, on board here. Because if a parent and guardian is watching me deliver this exercise, they're looking and thinking, what, what's he doing? He's just standing there. He's just watching. Of course, I'm observing and maybe giving a couple of individual pointers, but I've done my work off the pitch. I've created these environments that I want them to learn in, and now I can just let them problem solve through the environment, you know? But it may appear to the parents if you don't engage them in, your, in why you're doing things as if you're not doing anything. Um, so, yep, yeah, there's an example of a, an environment. Maybe they get it out in two minutes, and you're saying, right, I'm now challenging you to get it out within one, uh, et cetera. Um, so that's just an example. There's over 50 practices in the resource. There's over 50 games. So here's games, 3v3. 
Uh, if you score and you're in the red team, put a ball on the red cone. If you score, you're in the blue team, put the ball on the blue cone. Again, we need to engage the parents because if we're saying, um, if Sarah gets in the car at the end of her practice and mum or dad says, what did you do at practice today? And she says, I put the ball on top of a cone. Again, they're thinking, what's this coach doing? What, you know, however, we know through these environments, Sarah's getting a well done here for scoring a goal, putting a ball on the cone. Now she's motivated to come and try and score another goal. At the moment, our team are defending outnumbered, 2v3. The opposition are, have got an attack and overload, 3v2. It's spreading out, it's counter-attacking, it's maybe transition if they lose the ball. All these hidden things in the environment that would get quite exhaustive if we tried to coach them through instruction. So this is a resource you'll get in loads of these little environments. This just goes on to say, obviously, um, you can mix up the teams, play different opposition. It doesn't just have to be when they score a goal. It, it maybe you know you you know your players individually. So maybe you have a player that you're trying to encourage to dribble a little bit more, and they take on a couple of players, or they try and take on a couple of players, and you say, "Well done, go and put a ball on the cone." So now they come back out and they try those behaviours again because the environment encourages them to to do so. And the kids, in my experience, we're talking about 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds or this kind of stuff. They love this ball on the cone idea. They love this little progression that um, now you can choose to put a ball on your team's cone or you can run over and knock a ball off the other team's cone. You know, just being able to smash the ball off the other team's cone has a little bit of added motivation um, to try and display some positive behaviours, whether that be teamwork, passing, dribbling, shooting, whatever you're going to reward within the practice. As I say, the resource has got loads of practices, loads of small-sided games, and, and this is just a page in the resource of how you may choose to use it. Practice game, practice game, just game, 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 game. You can obviously read through the resource once it's sent out, but that's a, a little idea of what you'll find in it and maybe why you'll find it uh, as well. So this is the next real key bit, I think, in regards, in regards to making positive learning environments. I think we need to bring our instruction down as parents, coaches, and guardians. We need to bring the environment up. And then this is a crucial learning tool. We need to provide feedback within that. So if I was to play that video again, and, and, and I won't do it because I'll, I'll always be conscious of time and I won't keep you too long today, but that instruction comes down, that environment goes up, and then we need to observe and we need to feedback. So. We're saying to the group of three, um, okay, it took you five minutes to get all the footballs out there. What do you think you could have done to get them out a bit quicker? Oh, well, we could have pressed together instead of all of us going for individual football. There you go, great feedback. The best people to give the feedback is the players themselves. Having said that, once you have your environment right and everyone at your practice is practicing or playing football, it's a great opportunity for you to go give in little bits of feedback um, to individual players or two or three players maybe, that telling them what they need to hear as opposed to instruction where you're kind of guessing what they might need to hear. Feedback, you're, you're, you're genuinely giving them it. So I hope that makes sense. You know, saying to that team there, like, that was good, but defenders got all the footballs out. What could we have done to have made it a bit harder for them? Oh, well, we could have spread out. We could have been scanning. We could have been helping each other because, you know, I was kind of working with my buddy here to keep this ball together. We could have been helping the whole team. Excellent. And, and by them learning themselves, as I've already said, it's a stronger form of learning because they've said it to themselves. A lot of this re relates back, some of you may obviously know more of this field than myself, but you know, psychologists use this a lot. I use smoking as an example a lot because it was an area of work in a previous life that I, I was a big part of. Um, but we instructed people for years, you know, health secretaries and governments for people to reduce the, the smoking population in this country, um, Scotland, where I'm, I'm presenting from. And we said, you know, it costs you a lot of money, it's bad for your health, passive smoking can harm others, etc., etc., etc. And then we got that human nature behavior to say, well, I've always done it, my mates do it, it calms me down, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They'll have a justification for why they do it. It releases my anxiety, so I eat a little bit less and I lose weight. And that instruction just gets um, met with a lot of resilience. Uh, so what we did was we obviously changed the environment, illegal to um, advertise on smoking cigarettes, uh, illegal to see them behind the counter, illegal to smoke indoors, and that environment just made it a little bit more likely that your behaviour will be okay, we'll stop smoking now, and I believe that the smoking rates got a lot better. Same thing when you take it to an individual level, and you have someone sitting in front of you, and you say, 
you shouldn't smoke because of this, this and this. And they say, well, I smoke because of this, this and this. Little side note as well, if you tell someone don't smoke because it increases your risk of heart attack, that will probably increase their anxiety and they'll probably pick up a cigarette as well. So there is another reason why instruction um, can maybe be, be a little bit, it can be met with a lot of resilience. However, we say to a player, we say to a person, best thing is for them to give their own feedback. What do you think the advantages would be if you stopped smoking? Well, I guess um, I saved quite a bit of money. The house would smell a little bit better. You know, it helped me more in social situations because none of my friends smoke. And then they leave there after an hour consultation saying, I've just spent an hour telling myself I should stop smoking. I should probably stop smoking. Instead of that authority, you know, snobby psychiatrist guy that's telling me to stop smoking. Getting people to tell themselves things and, 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 and I, I shouldn't have to say it, but I'm obviously speaking to coaches and parents and guardians now. You know, parents and guardians saying a lot to players that, why didn't you do that? You should have done that. You should have done this. Let's try and engage the kids um, to find out what their understanding is and if they maybe need a wee intervention where we actually give them a wee bit of feedback. But if they can give it themselves, I hope that paints a picture because I'm, I'm rambling on a little bit. So where does this resource sit in regards to longer term development? So practice through play giving them all these situations to problem solve and standing back and being a bit patient, providing feedback where necessary. For me, it's not for everyone. I think we need to give a strong foundation first. And again, the best way I think as parents and coaches and guardians, we can support really, really young children who are playing football for the first time is engage the parents. And that's why they're in this webinar. Let them take part. I'll tell you what's not a positive learning environment, in my opinion, for three, four, five, and six-year-olds who are playing football for the first time. Their known and trusted adult, mum or dad or gran or grandpa, drops them at a strange place with strange kids with a strange coach and leaves them for an hour. And now they are crying for mum or dad the whole time. They need their lace done. They're asking where the bathroom is. They're asking what time it finishes. Get the parents involved. Tom Tiny Football is just an example of one program I've been uh, part of abroad um, and more recently in Scotland as well. Adult and child classes for young children to learn through the behaviours of the positive role models in their life. Just like how they're learning to read at home, just like how they're learning to eat healthy food at home, just, they're learn just like how they're learning body language and how to speak. They're following, they're not very good at listening to us yet, so let's not coach them through instruction, but they're very good at intimidating, at copying us. They're very good at and copying the behaviours we show. So a very short 30 second video that maybe this applies to you and you can take these ideas. Uh, and I had a gentleman reach out to me after this webinar just a couple of days ago, um, you know, to say he's starting that kind of under six age group at the, at the club. Uh, and can I potentially share a couple more ideas and session plans, etc. And of course, the answer is yes. Now, what do we do in the next, um, the next stage of things? Well, we can have a, a whole generation of kids that are overly dependent on the parents in their life or the, the guardians in their life. So once we identify that uh, a tall and tiny footballer. Football is now a, a fun, safe place where they've picked up all the skills from the adult. Now, I could go on a bigger rant about tall and tiny footballs and how quickly I believe kids were picking up skills just because they were seeing it instead of being told it from, from adults in their life. Um, but that, that's a different presentation. We now then say to the parents, guardians, that you only have two options now. They're moving into the next class. It's not parent and player or tall and tiny or, or whatever. And they're moving into the next class. You now need to take a step back because they need to be problem solving and they need to be independent. Or you become the coach because we're always looking for coaches. You can't get stuck in the middle somewhere where you're a kind of parent guardian who's going to help with the coaching from the sideline. You know, so tall and tiny footballs is great because we get into the young player's life early, but we also get into the adult's life early. And, and you see things on social media about how academies are starting U5s and everyone thinks, oh, geez, oh, that's mental. They're not saying they're starting a U5s and then they're going to go play Barcelona in the Champions League. You know, they're just getting in to young players' families earlier 
to tell, tell some key messages to help their longer term development because you'll have parents, guardians, coaches working with four, five, six year olds and, and already giving them preconceived ideas that you need to pass the ball with inside of your foot. Absolutely not. You know, I always say I've seen Ronaldinho pass the ball with his back once when the ball came from a goal kick and he jumped up and turned around and backed it to someone else. And um, so again, side story, we get into storybook soccer. How do I create positive learning environments in storybook soccer? And many of you will do this anyway. We engage the children through storylines. Okay, today, you know, your football is the um, pirate ship. I want you to sail around the sea, dribble around the sea. Uh, pirates love treasure. So every time you go around the cone, that's, that's a point. Um, watch out for the sharks. Now they think they're pirates going around the sea, collecting some treasure, watching out for the sharks. We know the footballers dribbling around the pitch, going around cones, watching out for the defender. And then they come next week. Right, hey guys, today we're in space. Rocket ships, your football. Get in your rocket ship, dribble around space. Every time you circle a planet, that's a point. Watch out for the asteroids. Same thing. You know, and it's just getting them really engaged through a fun storyline. Toy Story, Finding Nemo, et cetera, et cetera. Superman, Batman. Um, the storyline really, really engages them, but we know that they're practicing football. That's how we create that fun environment. Then it's practice through play, as I've touched on. Then, then we maybe give them a foundation um, to, to start to teach them the more, uh, more intricacies of the, of the game. Now, this isn't prescribed age groups, absolutely not. Every, every kid develops differently. So I've always tried to create programs where, you know, we have a pitch book for an hour, on one half is tall and tiny, on one half storybook soccer, and we can identify a kid in storybook soccer that's really disruptive, and we're saying, you know, actually, when you come next week, can you join in with, with him or her and go in tall and tiny footballs? You identify a tall and tiny footballer who's maybe only four years old or six, doesn't matter. Do you know what? They can be in storybook soccer. Can we have practice through play the next hour? Can we have developed your game the next hour? And obviously a lot of this ties into team training as well. So I thought this long-term development slide was a really crucial one because in my experience, parents and guardians are very desperate for their younger kids to already be doing some of this. And they're maybe questioning the coaches, you know, why aren't you doing some of this? Um, and coaches can be quite guilty as well, maybe guilty of it my, myself. Um, I'm just really keen to teach, teach, teach. And we've maybe just not um, allowed them to get a, a strong foundation first. So as it says here, in, in my experience, the longer time spent in practice through play, loads of touches and loads of small-sided game, the more proficient they'll be when I try and work on switching play, playing out from the back, pressing as a front three. Many, many people and players will be able to do it. But will they do it with that real cutting edge and that real quality if we've kind of missed any of these gaps in, the, in their learning? I have the same approach for develop your game. I've been working on the back four defending. I spend loads of time uh, planning my session, you know, more time than I'm giving instruction. How can I stretch the back four? How can I make it as difficult as possible for them in this environment? And then I give them wee feedback depending on what I see. I've kind of started, and this might be another wee point for you to start to think about. I've gone beyond writing down what my coaching points are going to be in my session because I don't I don't believe you know them until you see them. So I don't go in with any preconceived points. I go in with observation being my, my key thing. Um, you know, and then what do they need? It's really important for parents in here that they just they just support the journey because I know in here I can really start to sort of stretch players in here and make things difficult. And if I'm stretching them and the parents are stretching them, that's when it becomes a tough environment for them. When I'm stretching them, I want the parents supporting them. Of course, they might come back from injuries or a tough defeat, and I need to support them a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, that's the next little bit here. I think we need to give players a, a strong foundation so there's no gaps in their learning. Our first programs are all about developing a love for the game. Then we let them play the game. Then we can give them a foundation to learn the game. And maybe parents or guardians are expecting us from the moment they sign up for your teams for the moment they sign up for your programs to be learning the game of football because they think that's what they're signing up from. But you, you just need to be able to say, do you know what the first thing that he or she needs? We need them to play the game because we can't coach them until we can see what they can do and how far they can take themselves before we can maybe have to intervene. So, yeah, we'll move on. A real crucial point, a focus on the holistic development of the person and having fun, in my opinion, should be at all ages and all levels. 
because they're people before they're players, you know, so transferable skills like confidence, teamwork, communication, you know, everyone working together to, to try and achieve a certain goal. That is crucial. And um, these transferable skills, yes, we want them all to grow up and be the next Messi or Ronaldo, but inevitably they, they may grow up to be the next football parent. So can they then be a positive impact on, on the future generations as well in regards to a fun experience? In regards to instruction down and practice through play, um, I'll throw this in now, but I'll, I'll go over it quickly because anyone who knows me knows I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. Patience and standing back and letting kids dribble. She's massive. Underline that if you've wrote it down. It, let's get rid of the instruction of um, must play two touch or pass, 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 pass the ball. You, surely we can all see Messi, Ronaldo, Mbappe, Bale, Neymar, Diego Maradona and think, yeah, like, you know, dribblers are worth their weight in gold in football. Let's develop dribblers. And the only way we develop dribblers is by letting them dribble. And actually, the more they give the ball away and the more they fail, the chance they're going to be of being a better dribbler in the long term. Because that's how we learn anything. We try, we fail, we try, we fail. And every step of the way, we get a little bit better. And I've told the story loads of times because it's, it's not a unique one. It's happened to me a couple of times. I'm coming out for the consultation phase of practice through play. Uh, I'm going to try a little bit with um, a coach's team uh, and get some feedback from the kids at the end. And one coach told me, I've just got this kid. It was a young male player. He just doesn't pass the ball. He just always dribbles. And, and I always like it because it's maybe the only trendy thing I've ever said. I said to him, you've got a much bigger problem. You've got one kid that doesn't pass, but you've got 15 kids that don't dribble. And that is worth its weight in gold. Why? is the kid who always dribbles getting a harder time than the kids who always pass. I'm not quite sure why in my experience from what I've seen. And I still maintain that idea that if you have a player that can dribble by three or four players, at 15, 16, you can get he or she to pass a little bit more. If you have someone who always passes, you probably can't get them to dribble by four or five players. So that's a massive thing with instruction down. Um, for me, let the kids dribble. Parents, where do you fit in on this? I've already touched on it, so I'll skim over it. Be a role model. You know, they'll copy your behaviours more than they'll listen to you. Be patient with the coaches. Be patient with the kids uh, because patience is crucial and it's so easily thrown out the window uh, and we just want to teach, teach, teach uh, and then support them as I touched on. And hopefully there's a few wee ideas you're jotting down so relevant to any work that you do you can start to get the supporters. And by that, I mean parents and guardians. I'm going to start to refer to them as supporters because that's what they should be. Supporters of the coach and supporters of the players. Supporters, coaches and players all pulling in the same direction. Now, this is a real key message for the parents. You may want to take this and, and, and tell it to other parents you work with because it's one I say to them at the start of every season. And I, I really want the parents to decide, um, are they going to be a knowledgeable supporter? Um, or are they going to want to appear to be a knowledgeable supporter? Because it's very hard to do both. So if you want to appear to be knowledgeable in football, shouting a lot of uh, fancy terminology from the side, you know, knowing everything that the coach uh, or the referee should have, decisions they should have made, solving the problems for the kids, you know, uh, you know, Johnny, you've got a man on, or David, you've got Jamie open, or turn and pass it back to the goalkeeper. They all might be the right ideas. You know, and they, you, all, you might be saying all the wrong stuff. Obviously, there'll be a lot of coaches sitting here thinking, yeah, but sometimes they're saying definitely the wrong stuff. And I, and I get that as well. But you may be saying all the right stuff. But if you're an actual knowledgeable supporter, you know that, okay, I know this because I'm an adult and I've got 30, 40 more years life experience and I can see the whole game from my advantage point. But I'm knowledgeable enough to know that the kid needs to work it out. Okay, so do you want to appear to be great on the, the sideline or do you want to be great for the kids? And that's a case of let them work it out, let them solve it out, let them figure it out for themselves, particularly if you're a parent, because it's really not your, your, um, your place. So do you, or, or do you want to be knowledgeable? So despite seeing the game from, a, from your vast experience, your removed vantage point, you're watching the whole game, the kid can maybe only see the two or three bodies or, or areas of space around them. You've developed more skills, you know, kids, we, we appreciate that they're developing, um, you know, speech and communication skills and their bodies are growing. You know, there's other things that they need to develop as well. I'm reading a lot on this thing called gap affordance at, at the moment. Uh, the, the recent study I found was all on 
um, you know, traffic and this idea that, that young kids as they're growing, that they're still developing the sense of how fast things are traveling. So that's why they need to stimulate, simulate, um, you know, do you think you cross the road at this point? Yes, no. And then we need to put in, you know, 20 miles per hour in, in certain um, house and estates, speed bumps, signs that say, be careful, there's children in this area. Not there's people in this area, there's children in this area because they don't quite understand how fast things are traveling the way we do as adults. And that's why you maybe don't scream at wee Jamie when he doesn't go towards the ball because he actually thinks the ball's going to get to him. Or when he doesn't quite intercept that pass because he's still developing these gap affordance skills. And all you're shouting and instruction till you're blue in the face on the sideline, um, it's not going to help that until those skills have, have, have developed. Um, so this is a good slide that I use for parents. Maybe lockdown gives you a great um, opportunity to get the parents in a webinar. I'm more than happy to do webinars um, as well if you do have parents and just say to them like, look, yes, we know that you're probably going to see things and understand things a wee bit more than the kids, but leave them to it. Um, other little tips for parents as well. Um, you know, how, how often do I say to a coach or, or a supporter, uh, you know, how was... How was Frank's game at the weekend? Yep, we won 3 now. Wasn't what I asked. Didn't ask what the score was. Are they having fun? Did they get a lot of touches? Did they get a lot of game time? You know, that's maybe a wee culture change we need to get away from as well. Um, same to a young player, like, oh, did you have fun at football today? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, what, was it, um, what was the score? Oh, we lost 4 now. Um, did you score? No, obviously not. Um, and then something that they thought was a real positive experience, their football training, and two questions, we've just absolutely shot them down to the ground. You know, did you win? No. Did you score? No. Jeez, oh. So maybe we need to start to think about um, how we're wording and how we're saying things as well. I thought this was really good in a book I'm reading at, at, at the moment. Um, because it does kind of, this is a book all about developing habits and how long it takes to develop habits. And, and it really relates to the practice through play stuff that I do. Because it doesn't look like my little animations where everyone's spreading out and passing and moving, you know. Um, if you are going to invest in it and you are going to deliver it, this is maybe what we want to happen, what we expect to happen. The kids get gradually better every week. In my experience, you know, it, it's a riot. There's loads of chaos, but all those failures and giving the ball away and being unsuccessful, you know, one day for me, it just, it just clicks. It, just, it did just click with uh, the, the teams I've been lucky enough to work with over four or five year uh, periods, you know. Stepping back and appreciating the game day is actually just us practicing through playing. I've started to think about my week. I don't think about us training Monday, Wednesday and playing Saturday. I think about how we play on Saturday and that influences Monday and Wednesday. You know, so that's just where we start the week. We have a game of football, then we work on practice through play, and then we have another game of football, and we just get this here. And then one day it clicks. And uh, James Clare calls this in here, uh, the Valley of Disappointment. Loads of disappointment in here, and that's how you can be so easy to chuck the playbook out and try something else. So this is, um, I'm, I'm kind of getting towards the summary. Um, and as I say, I won't have you be on 3 p.m. UK time today. Um, this is the environment that we're trying to create. And, and through my experience, in so many national government bodies, Scottish Football Association, the FA, you know, other ones I've worked abroad, they, they do bang the drum about these type of environments and it's maybe it's maybe just that we're not all pulling in the right direction that's the actual problem but again that's a rant for another day as well so these are the learning environments i believe we're trying to create support of supporting coaches 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 coaching and players playing and I, I, it's maybe not too revolutionary that but believe it or not there's many people that need to hear it and i think about when i first started my coaching journey or, or even as little as four or five years ago i probably had to hear this because what we get is um, supporters coaching, coaches playing. And by that, I mean walking through every moment of the game. Pass, dribble, shoot, switch a play. There's David, there's Jamie, man on, you know. And if we get the supporters coaching or the supporters playing, the coaches playing, we don't get the players playing. Because I can guarantee you, and I've seen it, and I actually have some great video footage that, that I won't share because of GDPR and these kind of things, of a load of supporters standing on the sideline almost standing on the pitch the kids won't play then they won't we talk about them spreading out and getting chalk on their boots they won't then go stand on that sideline and ask for the ball if there's 15 over invested parents standing there get the parents five six meters behind have a line of cones and ask them to support because it's massive for the kids opportunity and the second that kid gets the ball 
tries a, a rainbow flick over her head and the supporters say either unlucky or they clap their hands or whatever. Kids are going to be in that environment to try these things again. And then we might be developing world, world-class world players as opposed to, yeah, I'm going off on a tangent. But this is what we want. Coaches coaching, players playing, supporters supporting. And worth throwing in while I have uh, while I have you here, referees refereeing. Not supporters refereeing or players refereeing or coaches refereeing. I always like that kind of little anecdote of the two dads on the sideline. And, and one dad says to the other, um, you know, what was your son so I can shout abuse at them? And the dad kind of says, you can't do that. And he says, well, you've did it to my son the whole game. Who's your son? A referee. Um, so we need to remember that. There's someone's son, dad, brother. That they're, they're just trying to learn the game as well. Just like the players and the coaches are trying to learn the game, so is the referees at, at, at grassroots and recreational level. I'm a firm believer that the referee will always mirror the standard of the game. The ref, Well, not always, because you do get some that are just horrendous and we need to live with that and be, be humble about that. But the referee is likely to make the same amount of bad referee decisions as a player's going to give the ball away or a coach is maybe going to make a wrong call. You know, If you're a Champions League level player, a Champions League level coach, you probably have a Champions League referee. If you're an under-12 level player, under-12 level coach, who's trying to learn their trade and get better, then you're probably going to have a referee who's trying to learn their trade and get better. Just a quick note on, on let's respect the referees. Because I, I have a role, not at the moment, because of the way the world is, of creating fixtures and um, getting kids to play football. And everyone's thinking, oh, can't believe we can't get any referees. Maybe we need to treat them a wee bit better and we'll, we'll get a few more. Anyway, as I say, coming towards the end of this presentation, and I hope this gave you maybe one or two things to think about. This is the last thing we want. Players have an ambivalence. So a player thinks he or she should dribble, teammate shouts pass, coach shouts turn, and they get in the car and the mum or dad says, why didn't you shoot? This is maybe something that can put kids off of football because what we need to appreciate that what we are um, in competition with is, if I use uh, computer consoles and computer games as an example, there's so many things, even phones and, and apps and different things that are beyond my understanding. Most of the things kids enjoy is where they have autonomy. It's where they can um, decide, they, they can design the world, they can design the character, they can design the car, they can design the method of transport, the clothes. They can speak to someone in New Zealand while you're playing against someone in China. Um, and they have so many things where they can make the decisions um, and no one's going to hassle them about that. So if football comes and then it's like over-prescribed and over-instructed, that, that's where they might fall out, uh, in my opinion, because they can go and do things where they have a little bit more autonomy. These are things just to jog your, uh, just some of your thinking. That This is so crucial because I don't want you to think practice through play is all about, let's create a fun wee learning environment and then just let the kids be in their comfort zone. Absolutely not. Some of the learning environments will really, really stretch them. And it's not that... Um, we're not stepping into it to help them too much. So we give them these environments where they're practicing or playing the game. They're in their comfort zone. They, they try a new skill, a new move. They make the mistake, but the environment allows them to get the ball, try it again. And with constant trial and error, they improve, they improve, they improve. And that's how kids learn. How they won't learn, and this is where patience is so, so crucial, is if we kind of put in this, um, a really good coach educator that I listened to recently who spoke a lot about safety nets. You know, putting in all these safety nets. So it gets 4v4, so we, we better bib up these four in yellow and these four in green. And that's where the sideline is. So we better put out 50 cones so they know exactly where the sideline is. And, you know, not like one cone. And if you dribble out, right, nope, you're out of play. Give the team to the other ball, you know. Uh, it's 4v4. Who cares? We're, we're going to play 2v6. Those two are going to play against those six because we know those two, are, you maybe know as a coach, they're a better player. We're going to play 5v3 because I want these three out of their comfort zone. And I want these five out of their comfort zone because they better not lose the game against three. You know, not that we're stressing too much on the score, but you're maybe giving that we come on, you're not going to lose against these three. So they're, they're, they're not learning. Um, and again, this is why it's so crucial to get the parents and guardians involved in what you're doing. Because I actually think about some of the last sessions I did um, prior to lockdown. If you were watching it, the kids were giving away the ball every couple of minutes. It was an absolute riot. Like, you know, and I was throwing in a couple of balls. Every, and that's exactly what I wanted. You know, they had to work really hard. I'm, I'm just thinking about it, and apologies if I'm going off on a tangent, but it was just kind of really 
tight rondo where they had to get X amount of passes before transitioning into the into the next box. And it was just the goal was within reach, but they really had to struggle to get there. And it was just new ball, new ball, new ball, you know. And Pedro's have been watching, like, is he gonna change this? Like this just totally isn't working. Well it was working because this is what I had, in my opinion. I'm not saying every session I do is, is absolutely dynamite. Um but this is what we're looking for. And there's just an example of, of Messi and Suarez. Um, regardless of how much your football playing or coaching knowledge is, sometimes the best thing to do is just to keep it to yourself and let the kids work it out or tease it out of them. That's a, that's a form of feedback. You kind of know the answer you want to get, but can you get them verbalising it? Um, because that's how they're, they're going to learn, by talking to themselves. Okay, um, now I, I wouldn't like to get to this stage and I've not gave you anything to think about. So, so these are a couple of things I would actively encourage you to definitely think about. Answer these questions in your own internal monologue or on your bit of paper. Is it important for children to have fun at football? Does having fun help children learn? What could you do, whether you're a parent, a guardian or a coach in this webinar, what could you do that would stop children having fun? Now again, in the consultation phase of practice through play, um, the coaches were giving me some great stuff here that they just weren't aware of until they wrote it down. What could you do? Oh, I could talk too much. They could stand behind the cone. I could make them run around the pitch. I could not let them pick their own teams. I could, et cetera, et cetera. We'll just have a look through that list and see if there's anything that you can adapt or stop doing. How can I raise my self-awareness? We'll come on to that in a little second, but here's a couple of little exercises for your, your parents or your um, players that you, you might find beneficial. Um, Again, in that consultation phase, we asked players to write down um, their three bullet points of their three favourite things about football training and three bullet points of their three least favourite things about training. Now, if you ask, let's say you work with 12 players, you might find a correlation between what they like and what they don't like. And if we're saying having fun is important and it helps them learn, you can maybe start to carry a little bit more weight and do a little bit more of the things they really enjoy. If there's a real common theme in the things that they don't enjoy, maybe, maybe stop doing it and Education is the real key thing. You know, I've I seen, obviously, won't name any players, clubs or coaches, but, you know, an under-10 girl and her bullet, under-10 young female player and her, her bullet point of um, least favourite things at football training, she wrote the bleak test. Now, you know, what coaches with nine, eight and nine-year-old girls are doing, doing the bleak test at football practice, not even an athletics practice or something? So, yeah, that's really good. Um, a really good... Uh, yeah, a really good thing you can do. Another one that was really, really powerful and the parents um, in particular fed back that, they, that this really opened their eyes was um, before match day, we just simply got the kids to write a do and don't list for their parents. So gave them complete autonomy, gave them complete pen and paper and, and just having in a kid's writing underneath don't for the parents, just in a kid's handwriting, a scribble that says, don't embarrass me in front of my friends was really impactful for the parents. Um, and if I find a picture, I can, I can perhaps share it. Uh, I know you've maybe did something similar. But just parents thinking, oh, geez, well, I hope that's not me that that one's relating to. Or, yeah, I didn't realise that, you know, that I do that kind of thing. Okay, how can you raise your self-awareness? I'm interested to know if anyone has any ideas. But um, the bullet point one's good. Some of you know when you kind of get up to UEFA licence and UEFA Pro licence, you know, really good coach education courses. So much of what they do is around coaching behavior and, and you get videoed by a performance analysis and you watch back and it's really, really eye-opening to see the behaviors that you actually do and maybe how much you actually instruct. And maybe for me, it was certainly some of the kind of nonsense I'm saying. Like, why am I even saying that? Like, there's no, there's no outcome to me constantly shouting that. So, so just stop it. You don't need to get onto one of these courses to, to video yourself. So I'm uh, interested to know who in the webinar when football starts back who has the bravery and the courage to say, like, see when I'm coaching, say to your helper coach or, or say to one of the parents, see every couple of minutes, can you just pull out your iPhone and, and video me for three or four minutes? Just whenever you get a chance, can you just video my sideline behavior? And there you go, you're getting a, a, an A license um, module for free and watch it back and it is so, so eye-opening, you know? Maybe you're going to say to all the parents that, like, see when we start back, we're going to do a wee bit of analysis. I'm not even going to be watching the game, we're just going to be videoing the parents. And then what do you think about this? Do you think this is good behavior? Do you think this is setting a good example for the kids, the way that this particular mum or dad has spoken to a referee here? Um, so video analysis is a real key one. And as I say, all you need is a smartphone or, or an iPhone. So hopefully that's gave you a couple of ideas. 
I did want to very, very quickly, cautious of, of time, last two minutes, just open the resource um, that you'll be sent. And again, don't take any of this as gospel. I just hope it's got you thinking and it'll give you some baseline ideas to then run with and, and make your own. And so much of it's baseline ideas I've taken from other coaches and, and thrown in there. Definitely not designed all of this. Um, but yet, we only have two types of practices. So they're either practicing or they're playing football. A couple of considerations, uh, such as what do you do when you have odd numbers. This bonus ball idea, because... You know, football's so unpredictable. You don't always have a back four lined up perfectly or a front three and right, left and centre. So just throwing a ball in and making the kids deal with uh, um, situations that very, very quickly, that, that move very quickly is really crucial. Practices, games, practices, games, how to use the resource, a little bit on area sizes and, and don't spend time. Again, I, only, I think the... I think the this is kind of in between 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I've used it with under-19s, but obviously you're maybe doing a wee bit more of learning the game at that stage. But they shouldn't be doing anything apart from practicing or playing football, so don't spend time setting up areas, you know. If you have a 4v4 and that's your size for your game, then put your practice within that area as well. Real basic stuff that, that maybe some of you need to hear, maybe some of you need to, to, to spread the word about. Environment up, instruction down. Be the best part of their week. You know, there's so many kids that you maybe don't appreciate what they've got going on in their home life or at school or what they're going through personally. I, I think I think football should be the, the best part of their week. Um, some players come because they love football. Some will come because they love the, the coach. Um, and yeah, we, we get these buzzwords about attention seeking or disruptive behavior. If a kid's seeking some attention, it's probably because they need some attention. So you might be the only one that says to them, you know, how was school? Or what teams do you support? Or do you want to pick the teams today? What's your favourite practice? What do you want to do? I tell you what's a great thing. Um, we talk about player autonomy so, so much. Um, and get ahead of the curve with this, you know, building player autonomy now because it's becoming massive. We talk about that one, for example, where it's like put a ball on the cone. Don't, don't you say, oh, great dribble, you know, come put a ball on the cone. Make someone in one team a captain, someone in the other team a captain. Say I'm the captain of the red team, and Jamie in the other team tries a good pass, regardless if he keeps the ball or not. And I'm saying, Jamie, that was a great pass you tried. Go give your team a point. That is massive as a 11-year-old kid for one of your peers to say, really well done, you go give your team a point. Yeah, so let's have fun. Let's have fun with it. And coaches, you should be having fun as well. Yeah, player autonomy. Kids pick the teams, let them pick the practices. Tell them when they show up to training just to get a game going. It will help you. It will help their timekeeping. Trust me, if they think they're showing up to run around the pitch, they think the, the earlier they show up, the more game time they get. You can read this through. Obviously, I won't. I won't. Um, we're into the last minute. This is a crucial one. There's no coaching points, and hopefully, I've touched on that enough. There's no coaching points in this resource because. I think they're becoming a little bit dated, preconceived ideas of what might happen at your training. All it is is giving environments, and then you can give feedback. Why do we ask for critical thinking players, but we don't expect critical thinking coaches? We see so much of it on social media, and I'm obviously not, there's different ways of doing things. I'm obviously not speaking down to the way other people do things. But, you know, someone sharing, here's my switch and play thing, and here are the coaching points, and um, scan, you know, whatever, and receive on the back foot. How do you know that I don't have a player who can switch it first time with outside of the right foot. Why do they need to receive on the inside of the left foot? So hopefully I've kind of painted that picture enough that I'm just here to try and give you a couple of environments that you can then see what happens and, and give real-time feedback. That's the way I think it should be done. And I'm not the only one, obviously. It's not, I'm not saying I came up with this concept. But I do think coaching points are getting a wee bit dated because we need to, as it says at the bottom here, we need to meet players where they are I'm not delivering a session for 15 U14 players and every U14 player in the entire world is the exact same. You know, in front of me, I've got Megan, Rosa, James, Christopher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Give them the problems, let them try and solve them, and then step in with information that they as an individual need to hear. I'm not saying, right, everyone freeze, stop. And um, I, again, I stole this from another webinar I, I held recently and it was great. You're talking to everyone, but you're talking to no one at the same time. Getting there. Apologies, getting there. I'm running over time ever so slightly. 
we waste in enhanced environment. Be cautious of your body language because you'll say more with your body language than you will with your words. Um, a little bit about just incorporating some free play, just letting the kids have a kind of playground idea because they maybe don't do that in the street as much as they used to and it's so beneficial. And then we get into here where it's not just my ideals, you know, far from it. And um, some coaches that I've been lucky enough to work with uh, over the years and um, given their positive learning environment. So you'll get loads and loads of ideals. Um, and hopefully you're in a position to maybe give me a little bit of feedback and deliver some of it when we get back on the grass. Um, this last week's slide here is just on player autonomy again. You know, just picking two players and saying pick a number between 1 and 12. And they pick 8 and you say, look, that's how we're going to set up the pitches next week. You need to say to all your teammates what the game is. Kids love it and they're so good at it and it takes them out of that comfort zone because they need to work together so we get a bit of teamwork. They need to have confidence to step up in front of their peers and they need to have leadership to say, this is the game and this is what we're doing. So, yeah, a couple of wee ideas um, um, throughout. I'm just going to finish by saying thanks for listening to me uh, uh, for an hour. Uh, I know this one was um, a little bit more presentation-based as opposed to discussion. Uh, you're now on the distribution list for that resource. It's not coming out next week, but the following week. So, so just hang tight and have that wee bit of patience. And then when it comes out, please give me any feedback uh, that you may have. I'm going to let you go because that's, that, that's me taking up your hour. Um, and I'll put my email on the chat just now if anyone does want to pick up any conversations. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Um, and I'll speak to you again soon. Thank you.